Okay. Okay, good morning everybody. Um, and uh, first of all, uh, to the team at ICTP, thank you for inviting me to be here. It's a great way to spend a public holiday, which it is in the UK. <laughs> My name's William Hoyle. Um, I'm from a, a not-for-profit organisation based in the UK called Tech for Trade. And I'm going to tell you a little bit this morning about uh, an initiative that we uh, set up last year called the 3D for Development Challenge. And some of the uh, experience of running the challenge and, and some of the learning from it. Um, so uh, we'll start, I think. So uh, yeah, I'll just tell you a little bit about, uh, about Tech for Trade. It's um, a UK registered charity and uh, uh, it was established at the beginning of, nine, of 2011. And the purpose of the organisation is really to support innovation um, in emerging technologies that have uh, the possibility, offer the possibility to improve trade and income opportunities for some of the world's poorest communities. Um, I just put this in here, an example of one of our other initiatives outside of the 3D printing arena is a project in Kenya where we're working with a small mobile agribusiness called M-Farm. Um, we've developed a service using mobile technology that links groups of smallholder farmers to buyers for their produce. And so in that case, the innovation really there is around different ways in which mobile technology can be used to organize unorganized communities. Um, you can read more about that project here. But this morning, obviously, I'm going to be talking about 3D printing. And, um, an adventure that really started uh, in 2011 um, when um, I, I bought a copy of The Economist and many of you will have seen this magazine's article um, the front page of The Economist early 2011 had a, an article called Print Me a Stradivarius and uh, I read the article I know nothing, I knew nothing, I still know very little about 3D printing but the article made me very excited because having worked a little bit in, uh, in Africa, some of the things I read in the article immediately made my mind think about possibilities, possibilities in developing countries for using um, 3D printing technology. And um, knowing very little about it, I immediately decided that I needed to find out more about whether or not some of my ideas were actually a, a real possibility. And I was fortunate that through a contact I was introduced to um, Dr. Philip Reeves. Um, Dr. Philip Reeves <coughs> is, um, runs a consulting firm called Econolist and actually he was the second person I think ever in the world to to get a PhD in additive manufacturing. And he very kindly took my phone call um, having read this article um, when I bombarded him with questions about 3D printing technology. And Philip said to me, let me tell you about 3D printing. It's all about high value and low volume. It's all about digital data, 3D, CAD designs. It's about personalization and developing consumer trends. It's about sustainable supply, supply chains. It's about integration of the web. It's about co-creation. And he went on and on. And as he talked, as he talked, my heart sank because as he explained these things to me, this was the picture in my mind. The picture in my mind was one of uh, all of the problems I could think of from a developing country perspective that I was trying to reconcile with this description. The problems of, of waste and poor sanitation and conflict and drought and this was these were sort of the conflicting pictures in my mind and and it was Philip who said well hold on a second actually we're talking about a market here he said let's think about the market opportunity and Im immediately I I sort of sort of came back to why why I had started to think about 3d printing in the context of development 
because it is about the market. You know, the base of the pyramid as a market is worth $25 trillion, whether or not you believe these exact numbers. 2.6 billion people earning under $3,000 a year still represent a $7 trillion market. And those people earning up to $20,000 a year represent an $18.5 trillion market. So there is a market at the base of the pyramid um, which um, is, is actually more and more a market that's looking to be served with products and services that often are very difficult to obtain because often locally the challenges that are faced in manufacturing and in movement are those of aging machinery that is difficult to keep um, working um, because, so for example, sourcing spare parts is difficult. Poor infrastructure that makes the movement of goods and services difficult. Um, a challenge really around even things like delivering um, educational content to, 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 to people in remote areas. And yet overall a desire, as I say, a growing desire to, to consume which um, presents significant opportunities. The more I read, the more I realized that um, very few people were talking about 3D printing as an opportunity, a market opportunity um, for <coughs> low-income countries. Um, I found lots of um, uh, descriptions of projects uh, and videos of people making things like some of the things on the shelves over there, little Star Wars figures and Yoda heads, um, but very few people really talking about uh, how 3D printing might make products and services or products that were needed in a, in, in a, in a develop, developing uh, world context. And so um, after some discussion with my board, um, at the beginning of um, 2012, we decided to launch a competition. Um, because it seemed to me that the, the best way to find out whether there were any ideas out there about the use of 3D printing for development was to actually um, launch a competition and invite people to submit their ideas. And um, this became the 3D for Development Challenge, the 3D for D Challenge. 3D for D because I was on Twitter and I was looking at um, all of these different hashtags that were being used, like M4D and ICT4D, and I thought, we need to have a hashtag of our own, and that's what I came up with, and it stuck. So the 3D4D challenge was launched in, uh, in May 2012. And um, I was fortunate enough to be able to raise uh, the money for a prize as an incentive to encourage people to submit their ideas. My biggest fear when we launched the challenge, though, was would there be ideas out there? And we were looking for um, really ideas that um, had three, three real components to them. Um, a, a product that could actually deliver some real social benefit. Um, a business case that had the potential to be sustainable. And a, and a project that had 3D printing technology at the heart of how the product would be brought to the market or be brought, brought to life. So because of my concern about whether or not we would actually receive enough um, interest, um, we decided to um, uh, try and stimulate some interest in the project. Um, but in, in a sense, the, the principle of the, of, the pro of the competition was very simple. Raise awareness of 3D printing in developing markets. Um, provide a mechanism for people with ideas to apply from anywhere in the world, wherever they were. Create a short list of proposals and then give that short list a small budget to work more on their proposals in order that they could develop a, uh, a pitch for our final. Um, and then award the winner a $100,000 prize to implement their project. So that was my, that was, that was my competition. That was my 3D for D challenge. And we launched on the 1st of May 
in 2012. As I say, I, I was concerned initially that um, we might struggle to find ideas and initiatives that would uh, be suitable applicants for the challenge. And so we decided to um, organise some innovation workshops to introduce the idea and encourage people to work on their ideas and their submissions uh, for the challenge. And over the course of May uh, and June last year, we ran workshops, in fact, in six locations um, at the hub in Bucharest, at uh, the University of Nairobi in Kenya, at MakerBot's um, production space in Brooklyn, uh, at the um, House for Hack in Johannesburg, and also at the um, University of Chennai, at the Indian Institute of Technology in Madras, and one other in London. And in all, about um, 250, 253 participants came to the workshops. They came from NGOs, they came from um, academic institutions, they came from local businesses, <coughs> local entrepreneurs who had ideas for products um, and had read a little bit about 3D printing but wanted to see whether or not the technology could make their ideas work. And we took um, we took all of the participants through a, um, effectively an innovation process to try and help them develop their ideas. And um, it was a really fascinating process because uh, you can see here we had people who came together, as, came together uh, in groups to work on, work on ideas that were selected through the process, ideas for uh, healthcare, ideas for education, ideas for water and irrigation, all sorts of ideas for making spare parts, everything from um, buttons to spare parts for sewing machines. Um, a, a plethora of, of ideas that, that came out of this, um, this process. Many of them were actually ideas for prototyping products. So people who had a product idea but were faced with the cost of making a mould um, to produce the product, um, you know, pr a, a cost of several thousand dollars in some cases, and we're looking for a, a means to prototype their idea in order that they could sell sufficient products to be able to convince the bank that they actually had a, a business case for their product. So, one of the ideas, for example, came from uh, came from Nairobi, which was um, the idea of. Um, making something that they called fair trade feedstock. So recycling waste from Kibera slum to make feedstock that could be sold um, at a significant uplift. Um, uh, we had ideas for hydroponic kits, um, parts to assemble hydroponic solutions, uh, parts for irrigation systems, various types of connectors. Um, we even had um, somebody who suggested making parts for condom machines, which I think, um, I'm not exactly sure where that came from, but apparently these vending machines often break and then remain broken. So lots of lots of ideas came out of the, the process and many of the people that met during the um, workshops agreed to stay together and continue to work on their, uh, on their ideas. Um, at the end of August, um, we selected, uh, sorry, at the end of July, early August, we selected a short list. In, in total, we had 78 projects submitted from around the world. Uh, from as far west as Chile, we had projects from Senegal, uh, Singapore, uh, Germany, uh, and a whole range of different, uh, different locations. Um, and these are the seven projects that were shortlisted by, we had an independent panel of judges who uh, chose the shortlist based on the three criteria I mentioned before. The um, potential social benefit of the, of, of the project, the uh, sustainability in economic terms of the, uh, um, of the project, and the, the, the centrality of the use of 3D printing technology. So from Israel, 
um, a project led by a guy called Boris Kogan, who had developed uh, um, an Arduino-controlled um, greenhouse, um, which actually is designed for intensive food production. Um, and Boris has been working um, in the Gaza Strip area trying to figure out how to increase the amount of food production in a, in a, um, a land-challenged environment. From um, the University of Washington, uh, the uh, Washi Washington Open Object Fabrication Team, um, who had worked on a project to enable waste plastic to be um, uh, reprocessed and manufactured on a large scale. Um, some of you may have seen um, a previous project from uh, this team at Washington because um, uh, they made, uh, received quite a bit of publicity uh, at the beginning of last year when they actually made a canoe, a full-size canoe from um, plastic milk bottles which they actually rowed across a, paddled across a lake in Seattle. I think the point was to prove that it, it is possible to make something of that size. I never know whether they got all the way across the lake in one piece in it, but they, um, they did. The project from uh, EN3D um, is quite an interesting project to make uh, effectively a, a custom groove um, that's modelled for the particular location that enables uh, solar panels to move and track the sun. And the 3D printing is used to make the custom groove that actually uh, enables the, the, the panel to move without requiring any sort of um, uh, uh, kind of a, a third party control of the panel. From the UK, uh, a team uh, from a company in um, Sheffield called Fripp Design and Research. Fripp have uh, developed a technique for um, the 3D printing of soft tissue prosthetics uh, using a technique for um, printing with silicone gel. Um, and they have um, perfected this technique to make prosthetic noses and, and, and ears and other soft tissue parts. Um, uh, and it's an incredibly interesting project in, in that um, they currently believe that they are able to reduce the cost of making, for example, a nasal prosthesis from around $3,000 to under $100. And um, further work needs to be done on the technology, but the possibility for actually making, three, making facial prosthetics available in developing countries is really, really significant. From Pune in India, just 3D printing, um, we're working on a project to develop a community business in Pune, um, empowering waste pickers to collect plastic that could be recycled into uh, uh, um, parts that could be sold locally for various products, but also parts that could be used to manufacture on demand uh, models for prototyping for local businesses. From um, Arnold's um, University, from the uh, uh, University of Kenya, a project from the Fab Lab in Kenya to um, actually make a 3D printed lasts to design sh orthopedic shoes for people whose um, feet have been deformed um, from a, a jigger infestation. And finally, a project from the UK to uh, manufacture solar lamps um, from used cola bottles with the, the parts, the assembly of the, of the, of the lamp um, being made using uh, 3D printing. This is a project in conjunction with the University of Pondicherry in, um, in Tamil Nadu. So you can see a very wide range of projects from different parts of the world. Um, the project that was uh, selected in the end was the project from uh, uh, the University of Washington in Seattle. And um, this is the team um, Matt, uh, Bethany and Brandon receiving their prize at the final which we held at the print show, 3D print show in London in October of last year with their uh, very nice 3D printed award. Um, this is the canoe by the way that, uh, that they made. Um, so Woof have developed a, um, uh, a technique for, for, for large scale 3D printing. They've developed uh, effectively a large 3D, uh, flatbed 3D printer. And um, they're working with a US-based organization called uh, Water for Humans in uh, Oaxaca in southern Mexico. Now, um, Water for Humans um, have a project um, 
around Oaxaca to install public sanitation facilities in remote villages around Oaxaca, which are quite mountainous. The, um, uh, the uh, <coughs> latrines that they're deploying, the composting latrines, are actually made from concrete. And um, getting these latrines into place in some of the villages is quite a, uh, a difficult process because of the weight of the, of the latrines. And what WOOF are doing is actually manufacturing the composting latrines uh, from uh, locally sourced recycled plastic. And um, they've been prototyping this for some time now, have now perfected uh, the manufacture of the latrine um, and are in the process of establishing a local workshop where members of the community will be taught how to make the latrines. Um, but beyond that, uh, once the skills are in place, the intention then is to um, enable the community business that's being formed to manufacture other products and services for the community. And um, Wolf are working with a, an organisation called Engineers Without Borders uh, to develop, in effect, a product library of uh, printable products that can be used in the local community for agriculture, for education and for other purposes. And the intention is that this community business will develop a sustainable income stream from providing products to the local community. This is um, an article about the um, the final project that was printed in The Economist uh, just after the final. In fact, um, the challenge received a, a lot of interest. Um, we, we were astonished really to find that the, the final and the story of the project and the story of our, of our finalists and our, and our winner was covered uh, pretty widely and these are some of the, uh, the, the titles that covered the final. And almost consistently, uh, I found that the reason why uh, organisations like The Economist and NBC were interested in the project was because uh, it was the first time they felt that they'd actually seen any sort of initiative focused on um, development opportunities for creating um, real businesses uh, around 3D printing uh, technology in a, in, a, in a development or a developing world sense. Um, and the interest continues, I should say. We, uh, we're still getting requests to connect um, newspapers, radio and TV with some of our finalists to establish how the projects are progressing. And those projects are progressing. In fact, um, as an example, um, this is um, the 3D printing, just 3D printing project in Pune. Um, uh, the business is now um, rebranded as Green Print Solutions. Um, uh, next month, they'll launch their first 3D printing kiosk in Pune. Um, the kiosk is available for anybody who has a, a design that they want printing to bring, literally come to the kiosk with their design or, or actually they can also send, uh, send the, the design online and they're actually printing for local firms who want prototype products made, for local architects who want designs for uh, buildings printing. Um, so they have a range of different types of customers for whom they are um, printing um, and will be printing at the kiosk. At the moment they're actually fulfilling orders using this mobile 3D printing shop which is travelling around Pune, um, literally pulling up at people's offices and factories and, and, um, and, and, and printing. Um, this is one of the bits of equipment that they, they're using um, at the um, dump where they're actually making the filament. And this is um, low-tech, this is called the refill bot. So they have, a flaker, they have a flaker bot that flakes plastic. The refill bot, which as you can see is essentially a, a large electric drill, makes the filament and then they've developed their own large um, 3D printer for, uh, for printing. And um, the, um, the business model for, just for Green Print Solutions is really based around, I guess, two income streams. One is um, purchasing virgin ABS filament to meet the needs of um, businesses in, in the community that want better quality prototype products printed. 
And then secondly, um, providing printers to uh, schools and colleges around Pune who are actually buying uh, HDPE filament that's produced by the waste pickers, um, which can then be used to, uh, to print uh, in the educational establishments. Um, the waste pickers um, that work on the dumps around Pune um, can earn about 10 times what they would earn from selling their plastic to an ordinary recycler if they participate in green print solutions new value chain. Um, that, that's quite a significant sum of money. Um, at the moment they're making around I think 10 kilos, um, 10 kilos a, a week uh, of um, recycled filament but that, that will um, increase as, the, as they're able to drive the demand. But the, the, perp the real idea here is to try and develop the business model for a replicable community business that will then be established in other, uh, other towns and cities in, in India. The waste pickers in Pune, there are 80,000 waste pickers working just in Pune. That's just one part of, uh, of India. Um, uh, it's estimated that, uh, um, that there are something like one and a half million people in India that earn, them, earn their living collecting plastic on the dumps around India. So um, it's, um, it's kind of an interesting, it's an interesting model. At the moment it's very, very, it's very small scale, um, but, um, but an in, it's an interesting, um, a, an interesting kind of proof of concept for what could be uh, potentially a, a replicable community business. Um, I can just go back. Um, just uh, on a couple of the other projects, um, um, for design and research, um, I mentioned that the soft tissue prosthesis, uh, we're currently in discussions with um, uh, an Indian healthcare group about the possibility of a field trial of the prosthetic um, initiative in, in, again in India. I think there are some challenges, uh, unknown, unknowns around uh, the printing of soft tissue prosthesis which are to do with um, how the prosthetics fare in different climatic conditions in terms of you know, humidity and heat and, and so on, but the only way we'll find out more is by um, exploring them with field trials. Um, uh, the, uh, the, the, the Kenyan project, Roy's project, I think has just about secured some funding from a, um, a foundation in Kenya. For, 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 for trials as well. Um, and I think also the Cololite project has now received some funding for a trial in, in Pondicherry, uh, a, a larger scale trial in Pondicherry. So, so the, 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 these projects seem uh, to have developed um, both relationships from the final and interest from the ongoing publicity that's actually helping them to continue to move forward. Um, we, um, we, as I say, we received a lot of interest about the competition and, and, and a lot of connections were developed through the competition and in fact um, we've now uh, established a, a, a database of several hundred individuals and organisations who are working on projects associated with uh, 3D printing and development in some way, shape or form. I, I don't think I could describe them as a a community, but there's certainly a group of individuals with a common interest. Um, this is a, uh, another group that we came across recently. Some of you may have read about um, Haiti Communitaire. Um, this is a community printing business that's been established in Port-au-Prince. Um, they, uh, they received a donation from MakerBot uh, 3D printing equipment uh, and they've trained local people to start manufacturing um, products that can be used in Port-au-Prince again from a, uh, a library of products that's being built up um, I think in this case um, from um, Columbia University in the US and we seem to find new initi initiatives emerging daily I'm not sure about this bioprinter um, this is, I think, a cartoon from one of the UK newspapers. But almost daily, we find somebody that's trying to do something new with 3D printing in the development space. Um, I, I think um, I, I think the opportunities for 3D printing in in in, in developing markets is huge. 
Some of you may have co come across Joshua Pierce from uh, Michigan Tech. Um, this was Joshua talking about um, uh, the work that they're doing there to develop um, uh, what they call the recycle bot. Um, and the vision that Joshua's team have is, is for uh, pr the provision of open source tools that enable um, and sustainable energy sources in terms of solar, solar powered charging carts from printers and things like that. The, the tools that enable um, people in developing countries to literally, as he says, print themselves out of poverty no matter where they, no, no, no matter where they live. Actually, I'm just going to come back. The, the, the point about 3D filament ink, I think, is an interesting, an interesting one. And um, Alessandro was talking a little bit about it. And I think there'll be more discussion about filament over the course of the, the next couple of days. Um, I'm not a materials specialist, far, far from it. I know relatively little about 3D filament. Um, but my sense is that um, there is a potential for 3D printing um, to become a little bit like 2D printing in terms of the business model in that uh, we all know that with 2D printing buying a printer is relatively cheap buying the cartridges is very expensive and the business model revolves around the premium that's paid for the cartridge and if you ever try and put a cartridge that's not manufactured by the manufacturer of the printer into the printer, the printer immediately tells you that you've done a bad thing. Um, my sense is that the price of these machines is coming down a lot faster than the price of the filament. And that's kind of interesting. Um, I was uh, talking to somebody um, who um, is a bit of an expert in uh, um, uh, market uh, research and assessing, assessing market trends in this industry not long ago. And he was telling me that um, his view is that the market for 3D filament in the, uh, at the low end of the market, if you like the consumer home office end of the market over the next three years could grow to between 100,000 and 150,000 kilos of filament per month. Now, at current prices, that's quite a lot of money. That's quite a big business. And, um, and I would like to think that there is an opportunity um, for um, recycled plastic from uh, developing countries, from collected by waste pickers in places like Pune, to actually take a small slice of that market and return significant value back to those, those markets. Um, but there are, there, are, there are a number of challenges. I mean, there are challenges in developing, in developing community businesses around 3D printing in developed markets, which are, you know, I mean, these, this is not an exhaustive list, but I mentioned the product library. Um, my, my sense is that there are a number of different organizations working on uh, product libraries for 3D printable products that could be used in, in, in the developing world. Um, I mentioned Michigan Tech, they're working on a project. I mentioned um, Columbia, they're working on a project. Uh, Stanford are uh, Engineers Without Borders. I keep coming across organizations. Uh, Thingiverse, um, uh, MakerBot have plans to develop what will become a kind of social Thingiverse, which will be another repository of, of designs for, for products for development. Um, we touched earlier on affordability and, and access to equipment. I think. Um, the challenge here is not just about, about the machines, it's about things like the scanning technology as well. It's the, uh, around the equipment to, um, um, to shred and, and extrude filament. Um, filament recycling itself, I think there are, there are lots of things that need to be done in this space. Um, if, if recycling filament is going to become commercially viable, um, there are all sorts of challenges with making recycled filament impurities that get into the, into the filament. Um, pigmentation um, of the filament is another one. Um, if anybody here is working on anything to do with um, um, 
you know, interesting techniques for in, in, uh, introducing pigment into recycled filament um, that's kind of in, you know, commercially viable. I'd love to know more about it. It's definitely something we would like to, uh, we would like to uh, get um, closer to. Um, Off-grid printing I've mentioned as, as well. Um, uh, where power is uh, unreliable, it can create all sorts of problems. In fact, I was just uh, saying to Arnold in the break, um, um, we arranged for a MakerBot to be donated to the University of Nairobi. Um, and I think they had a power surge in the university, which immediately screwed up the, um, the nozzle um, and stopped the machine from working. Um, and it took quite a while to get... Um, I think eventually you've had a replacement delivered. But um, so... Um, Power can create all sorts of problems where, where power is, um, can be interrupted or um, where you get power surges. And I think, I think for me, what almost the biggest is sharing of business models. Um, I think Pune, as an example, and, it, and in fact Oaxaca, um, for us is really going to be a, as much about learning about the business model as it is about the technology. Um, is it really possible to develop viable community businesses around this technology that can actually stand on their own two feet by developing um, products that are, are, are wanted and needed by the communities that, um, uh, that, are, being, that are being served. Um, I think we're at a very early stage in, in, in our learning of this, but certainly over the next 12, 18 months working with um, a couple of the projects that we're um, fairly closely involved in, um, I'm hoping that we'll be able to share more about how these business models emerge and, and hopefully find um, more opportunities to collaborate with other people who are interested in developing similar community-based business models um, uh, around 3D printing. So um, relatively short and sweet, um, I'm, as I say, I, I, I see this as working together as a, a new community. Um, it's been an exciting adventure for, for, for me, um, I'm meeting some, some new uh, collaborators. Um, uh, Alessandro um, was talking about the, the, um, the rep wrap earlier on. If you go to, um, um, if you go to 3 d 4 org, you'll see a short video of uh, Dr. Adrian Bowyer talking about the 3 d 4 challenge and sharing um, some of his ideas about, about 3D printing for development and, and a number of other um, uh, a number of other videos as well. You'll also find um, an interview with each of our finalists on there, a video interview, um, where you can hear the, the finalists talking a little bit about themselves and their projects. And at the end of the conference, I will, through, um, th through Enrique or one of the team, I will also make the, a URL available to a slightly longer video, which is the final itself, where you can see all of the seven finalists pitching their ideas, um, 10, 10 minute presentations where they pitch their projects to the, the judging panel. So if you're interested in watching those and hearing a bit more about the ideas themselves, then, uh, uh, then you'll be able to watch that uh, in, your own, uh, in your own time. So thank you very much uh, for your attention. And uh, if there are any questions, I'll be happy to take them. talked about recycling. Is there already a, a recycling for the plastic which is used for printing? So I can imagine a small material will be produced that also then kind of a market for this. Yeah, there, so there is a market for recycled plastic. Um, the, the issue I, I think that is that those people who provide, um, who provide the, the legwork to undertake the recycling receive very little of the value. So um, um, I, I, have the I can't remember the figures offhand, but um, the, uh, I, think, I think in Mumbai, um, the, the, the recyclers in Mumbai in, the, in, 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 in some of the slums, the dumps in Mumbai, are earning around, it's something like a dollar per hundred kilos of plastic collected. Um, so so I, I think uh, there, is a, there is a recycling process already. Um, the question is how can you actually deliver more value from the recycling closer to the... Uh, because I could imagine that this plastic which is used is better quality. You could actually kind of easier recycle that than, than just other plastic. Then we have the next speaker. Yeah. Recycling plastic. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I 
Um, my question also concerning the, the new business model. They say the developing country may create their own uh, digital files which will sell it to the world and the rest can print it. So they, they, they put the creative part, right? This is also another variable to consider. Yeah, I, 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 I do, I, I actually. I, I mean, um, I think, I think, I think may create product designs which which are available for other parts of the world. So, um, um, for example, in, in Nairobi, I met a team recently who are um, working on a design for um, um, a wireless router um, which has um, battery backup and a, um, a, a GSM card in it and um, local file storage. So it's actually a router that's designed for countries where you have interruptions in power and interruptions in, um, in broadband availability. Um, and they've, they've actually designed the product themselves um, and, and obviously made the physical casing and, and so on. Um, so yeah, I, I could see that happening. I mean, I think the big, one of the big challenges is going to be around, maybe around the digital rights side of things, particularly with um, people making spare parts for machinery and then making that available on, online. Um, I think that's going to be one of the big, big challenges. Yes, the question I have is on the mass production. Now you, you already have an intricate part that you, you think is um, marketable, and uh, because of the time for production, do you, do you, how do we balance that together? Do you mean, you, you mean the, the economics of mass production? Mass production I, I, think, I think when you look at the economics, you've got to take into account, account uh, distribution as well. Because, because the, often the challenge that, w that, that we find that's faced in, in, in uh, economies with poor infrastructure is actually the cost of distribution. So, uh, I mean, for example, um, we have a project uh, in a different field in, um, uh, in the Copper Belt in Zambia. Um, and um, we're exporting agricultural produce into southern DRC. Um, and I was, in, I was up in Kasumbalesa at the border with southern DRC about four weeks ago. And I know that to, to get um, most, most products that flow into southern DRC flow up through Zambia. And it can take two weeks for products to cross the border. So, um, so I think the economics, and, uh, the economics have to take into account the, the challenge of distribution and the speed at which you can make, for example, replacement parts available uh, if you can print them, print them locally. Um, I have a concern about uh, getting the plastic to make the filament because you spend a lot of electricity in countries that they might not have much money to pay for electricity. You mean in shredding the plastic and yes. the machines? That those the machines for the, the uh, I mean, for example, in Pune, the flaker bot and the, and the refiller bot can also be operated manually. Oh, so they have the, they have manual variants. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and sorry, Michigan Tech are working on solar yeah. power variants as well. And the, you are planning to have a second round of this challenge for the future? <laughs> <laughs> if I can find another hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> Um, I think um, I think we are, so I think the answer is um, we are I'm really interested in this concept of of, of um, developing what I describe as ethical filament. You know, it, for me, in in simple terms, I, I, I see I see the filament market as embryonic because the market for these machines is going to explode exponentially, and I think there's an opportunity for if you like a fair trade filament market to develop. But for that market to develop, I think there are questions that have to be answered um, about how you produce a product, ethical filament, fair trade filament, that's commercially acceptable. And some of those challenges, I think, have to be overcome. For, uh, the, the pigmentation is one, for example. So I think we will look to, to fund another challenge but I think if we do it will be much more focused around how do we how do we encourage people to solve some of those problems to enable um, to enable um, business to flourish at the base of the pyramid which can support demand in home markets and also meet part of the needs of the, glo the emerging global market 
you know, I have this picture in my mind, and it's you can tell, I, you know, it's, it's kind of more, I think, um, a kind of a, a emotional kind of answer to this, which is, which is, um, in the UK, for example, um, most design and technology. Um, uh, uh, classes taught in secondary schools, most design and technology labs have 3D printers because the cost of these machines is relatively affordable. What a lot of the design and technology courses fail to find is curriculum and content that contextualizes the, 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 um, uh, the purpose of 3D printing. When we ran our final in London, a lot of design and technology teachers came <coughs> to our stand and they said, where can we get the, the film of your um, you know, of, of your final. We want to show our pupils about, we want to tell them about some of these ideas. So I have this picture in my mind of a, a, a reel of recycled filament with a QR code and you can scan the code and you can actually see the film of where the film filament came from and then you can understand the story of the value chain. So that's kind of, you know, the picture. And I would love to, I think, find communities 3D printing communities who are interested in working on that with us. I mean, the, the RepRap community is a, an obvious one, um, but I think the educational community might be another, where they can see the, you know, the value in, 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 in making that, that value chain work. Any, any more questions? Probably in education has a lot of potentiality. I think so, yeah. 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 So who was your first donor, can we know? Or Our first donor? Yeah. Uh, where, you mean where the money came from? Yeah. I can't tell you that. If I told you, I would have to kill myself. <laughs> <laughs> it was a, I can tell you, it was a private individual. It was a, it was a private individual. Okay, thank you. Okay.